everyone, and welcome to Ecom Power, the Walmart Marketplace podcast. And maybe today is just going to be me. Maybe Norm will surprise us, but we have an amazing guest today that I'm super excited for this conversation. And so today we're going to discuss from online to offline, selling a product to U.S. retailers. So before we start, let's take a quick note from our sponsors. Are you struggling with your Walmart marketplace business? Do you need help from a skilled and reliable virtual assistant? Well, look no further than Virtual Assistant Academy or VAA Philippines. VAA specializes in locating, screening, training, and supporting high-quality Walmart VAs in the Philippines. Their VAs receive extensive Walmart training and ongoing professional development and are committed to long-term working relationships with you. Partner with VAA and experience the peace of mind knowing that you have a dedicated Walmart-trained VA who's up-to-date with the latest tools and trends in the dynamic Walmart marketplace. Head over to VAAPhilippines.com and let VAA match you with your ideal VA today. All right, welcome back. So today we're going to discuss on how to go from online to offline. We're going to find out how to find the right buyers in department stores for your products. Um, how do you know if your product can be is a good fit for physical stores? And we're also going to know what is the potential in the order volume in retail. So um, our guest today, um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of our guest today. He's been selling product to retailers since 2005 and is the owner of Retail Empire. He sold almost every category, bringing many e-commerce brands to retail. Um, if there is something about retail that Talor doesn't know, uh, it probably isn't worth knowing. So please welcome Talor Offer. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Mikhail. How are you doing? Hi. How are you doing? Thank you for staying Very up good. for us. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks for having me. <laughs> yes, yes. So I'm super excited. I think um, we live in this world that there is more brands than ever, and they're still coming out. I wish, you know, uh, it, it's probably interesting. I don't know if you know the, the statistic. How many new brands are launching every year? Is there a number for that? I don't have the number, but I do have the slogan for that. And that was what? something I heard, I think, from Norm. Uh, that was quite a while ago, but he was saying, I think it was him. He said, the rise of the micro brands. And that caught me because that was, you know, that was defining in one sentence something huge, a huge wave. And it's not just not a wave, you know, it's, it's more than a wave that is happening for quite a while. It's been like a few years like that. And I guess Amazon has its part of bringing mm -hmm. this um, rise of the micro brands. And now in a place where we are sitting, we already know that there are so many other places out of Amazon. Obviously, Amazon is huge and everything. And, but you are mainly dealing, as far as I know, with Walmart Marketplace, which is, again, something really huge, especially when you're looking at Walmart as a company that has, you know, tens of thousands of stores across the world especially in the States, but not only. I myself, I used to live in China. And when I have seen uh, Walmart the first place, for the first time, I think it was back in 2004 or five, and I've seen a branch of Walmart, I was like, wow, they are getting huge every second. And it took yeah. them like less than a few months to have their stores all over the place, all over China, which is wow. something huge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yeah. Every time, I yeah, go ahead. No, I said I, I just recently, I think like maybe six months ago, I um, had an interesting conversation um, with a very interesting guy, uh, Charles Koch, and he was telling me that there is a um, retail store, like Walmart stores in many places in the world. I, I, I had no idea. And so that was very interesting. That's true. Know. Yeah. And I have to say that every time I'm coming on a podcast, it doesn't happen that much, but every time I'm coming on a podcast, I'm thinking to myself about the topics and I'm thinking like, how in the world am I supposed now to put, to squeeze more than 20 years of experience into a conversation of less than an hour? 
And you know what? It's it's doable. It's doable. Obviously, you can touch all the aspects, but you can deliver the message. So just yeah. a quick, um, just a quick uh, um, intro about myself. I've been selling to uh, products to retailers in the United States for the last more than twenty years. A funny point: I have a WhatsApp group, a silent one, where I post once a day, and I I posted a question like a few weeks ago, asking like it was a survey asking. When I'm saying brick, I mean, when I'm saying uh, retailers, does everyone understand what it means? And surprisingly, most of them didn't know. And I was like, okay, they are in the group, they are interested in what I have to say, which is cool. And they don't know what the, what the term retailers means. So let's start from the beginning, from scratch. Yeah. When you walk in the uh, in the street and you're seeing a Costco store, Macy's, Walmart, Target, whatever it is physical stores with shelves with people selling you products nothing no keyboards no mouse you know that this is a retailer now a retailer could be one store but when we say retailer we mostly um, are referring to chain stores which has between lowest uh, number of 30 stores across the us or in one area uh, up to 16,000 just like um dollar tree 16,000 stores is quite oh, wow. yeah 60,000? 60? 16,000, 16. 16. Yeah. yeah. That's, well, oh my God. Are they the biggest chain in the US? I believe so, yeah. They are the yeah. biggest. CVS, although they have, does it say that every every place you would step in the States, uh, I think 20 or 30 miles from you, there's going to be a CVS. That's the calculation. So CVS has 9,900 uh, or so stores. Um, but yeah. Uh, the, the Dollar Tree is the biggest, and then you have a few similar retailers with 11 and 12 and 13,000, which is quite huge. But most of the retailers doesn't like there's tons of different retailers with 100 stores like Schnacks and a few thousands like TJ and Costco and so forth. The big giants obviously are Walmart and the others, but yeah, there are stores with like a few hundreds, and there's so many of them. Bills of Florida, which I work with quite a lot, has less than 500 stores. And sometimes you might be surprised, but their volume of orders is sometimes bigger than big companies like Costco. Uh, so, yeah. Yeah, that is so interesting that um, I have a lot of questions for you, but I think like my first thing is that um, because so many people coming today, you know, they have a brand, they're going on Amazon, and they start because of Amazon, you know, they want to make some money. Uh, actually, something really interesting I heard not so long ago is that that e-commerce booming actually created in the U.S., probably even in the world, a huge amount of new millionaires. There's like a lot of new, a lot of new millionaires from e-commerce. So that's, that's true. I think that's interesting to know. Uh, some people are some people are failing. <laughs> some people are actually <laughs> making money. It is tough. Uh, we don't know. <laughs> But um, um, do you think um, all e-commerce sellers should be um, should be aware of the fact that they can go to retail? Because you know, in the past, it used to be like people would start with retail, and you know, big brands used to always be retail, and then they kind of understand they need to go to e-commerce. And now it's kind of the opposite. People start right. first in e-commerce. And then they uh, they realize there is also you know more opportunities to go to retail. So, so like, yeah, what's I mean, about that? Like, so like just to understand the entire whole, uh, online channels in the United States, including Amazon and marketplaces like Walmart and and all the other dot com and everything all together is no more than fifteen percent. That means that. Okay, the 85% the is not everything brick and mortar, there are so yeah. many other things, but brick and mortar chain stores, traditional ones, are probably somewhere around 50 to 60%, which means they are more than three times bigger, yeah. uh, even four times almost, than Amazon, which is something to understand. Now, I used to say something that I realize is not true. So I used to say, not, 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 it's not true, it's not precise. I used to say that uh, if you don't have either a good chunk of SKUs, let's say 10, 15 at least, or very good branding, or very, very special 
product, which is maybe design patent or utility patent or something that the market hasn't seen, then there's no reason for you to go retail. But that is not completely true because I've seen a lot of boring brands, like the people that are vendors that are selling like very common products that you can see in the market very easily, indeed succeeding in retail. And I think the reason is that it depends on what channels you are uh, pointing your brand. So if you look at channels, when I say channels, I mean inside the brick and mortar, I could divide it to a few of them. So the basic brick and mortar would be moms and pop stores, which means like a standalone stores probably, and that's why they call it moms and pops, probably belong to a nice couple, maybe their son working with them, the grandmother, the uncle, whatever it is. It's just a local store. Sometimes they open another two or three in their area, but it's a very local business. And with this kind of business, you can not only email them easily and find their contact because, you know, they're accessible, unlike the giants, but you can also pick up the phone and, and make a nice sale call. Now, the issue for them, for companies like that, is that they don't tend to go to exhibitions. They don't tend to import from China. They tend to take from local wholesalers, and that's why they need more variety. And that's why you, where you, as a vendor, even if you have very common products, this is where you uh, um, get into the picture and selling them your products. That's one, obviously, small thing about uh, small, uh, I would say, lower level of, of the retail a better level of the, 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 the retail is where you start working with, again, chain stores that are not big, 30, 60, even one or 200 stores. Those companies indeed are going to uh, exhibitions, not as much as they would want. And again, they tend, like all the other retailers, not to import from China or anywhere else because it's yeah. quite complicated. So that's where you can step in and say, hey, I have lovely products. Maybe they just had a problem with their vendors. Maybe they don't have your products. Could be so many different things and you can step in and start selling them. And just to understand there are different level of pricing and that's how we define retailers. You have the off price uh, retailers such as DJ Max and uh, uh, companies like Home Goods and Burlington and uh, Bills of Florida, which we spoke about Gabe's. And then you have the medium type of retailers such as Michael's, Tractor Supply, um, Lois, maybe Lois is in between somewhere. And then you have Walmart, of course, and the Giants. And then you have the high end, which is, you know, Saks Fifth Avenue, and Macy's, and Urban Outfitter, Kate Sped, companies like that. So you have to understand before you even think about approaching which one of them is going to suit your products. If you're selling a T-shirt for $9 or $5, then obviously TJ is the address. But if your T-shirts are something completely different and, you know, super fashionable and beautiful, then you're going to go sell them for $29.99 or even $49.99. Then you're starting to get to talk about different type of retailers. So all in all, to make it short to your question, there's probably space for every vendor out there yeah. to go into retail. Yeah. I, I cannot tell you that was like a perfect answer and I like the story especially with the moment I think this is like a a really gold tip the reason why because um you can make some extra income just go around you so funny story so I have I'm using a shipping store that is next to my house where all my returns are coming and they um they're smart they're a family on business and they know people coming in and out of there and they have merchandise. They have, so I see the merchandise and I know exactly where they get it from, from all these wholesalers, they get in, you know, <laughs> uh, yeah. all kind of feel, you know, they match it to the season. So now if it's Valentine, it's like teddy bears and in the holiday and they always have like um, different candles and, and a lot of the store is packed with merchandise. And um, when I started getting my returns, they, they started getting, being very curious on my product and I do have a couple of uh, my own... Uh, brand and then i told him hey just put it here don't pay me just see if it sell and right. guess what it's selling and they keep on reordering for me and that's it oh I, that's it, amazing i never thought that's about beautiful. this is actually a good thing to <laughs> give to people go to stores around you small store and start there because why not so i love beautiful. that, love that. Yeah. beautiful <laughs> love that. so um yeah let's let's get to our question so uh, how to find the right buyers in department stores for you know for my product 
Yeah. So basically, as I mentioned before, we're looking at different type of companies. When we look at moms and pop stores, it's quite easy because you can go to yellowpages.com or yelp.com or any website like that. There's tons of other websites, but Yelp and Yellow Pages are the good ones, the reliable ones. You can start searching. Let's say you are just a tourist. Think as a tourist. I just yeah. came here. You don't necessarily need to leave from abroad, but just came to the city. I don't know where to find, let's say, toys. Okay, your, your sunny toys. It's going to give you a list of toys uh, 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 stores. You would probably um, quite easily understand that some of them are chain stores. Like, okay, you can find toys, whatever, at Target. But some of them would be small stores, small stores, and you can click on their website, go to the website, find the email, send them an email, or give them a call, introduce your products. We'll talk about how to introduce products. That's one thing to do. If you want to scale it to the bigger areas of talking with buyers that are, you know, sitting with millions of dollars of budget, then you want to go and do two things. The first thing you want to do is go to the heaven of finding buyers, which is right on under your nose, and it's called LinkedIn. It's a living heaven. Now, a common mistake I see, not, not a mistake, but something that you have to be aware of, is that if you build your profile properly and you connect yourself with a few buyers, then algorithm of LinkedIn will offer you more buyers that are on their second and third circle. But if most of your friends are Amazon sellers or influencers or whatever it is related with Amazon, it's not going to happen. So if your LinkedIn profile is already there and it's related with companies that are all around Amazon, then you either want to start, you know, removing unnecessary contacts and adding those that are relevant for retail or even open a new account. It's that far. If you look at my LinkedIn Taylor offer, T-A-L-O-R offer, you would probably see that out of, I don't know, I guess three, four, five thousand connections, whatever the number is now, 95% are buyers. 95%. I'm trying, like, I, I do accept, obviously, requests from people and I do it happily and it was more than welcome uh, uh, to join. But it's a good thing uh, to have them because once I started with the first 50, 60, then I got tons of them coming in as offers from LinkedIn. But that's just one uh, uh, option. There are a lot of different databases and you have to do your own work, homework. But if you go on a company like Zoom Info you, and you want to uh, uh, buy, uh, uh, verify emails of buyers from a certain category or subcategory, you will have to pay tons of money. And I'm talking about tens of thousands. That's what they charge. But there are smaller companies. The only problem with them is that you'll have to work harder because their system of verifying verifying those uh, uh, um, contacts is not that good. I don't recommend to use Sales Navigator on LinkedIn. This is very, I would say, advanced tool. I myself do not even use it even now when I'm quite in a big scale of, of, you know, finding more and more buyers, but just saying, okay? So these are the two typical things, uh, three typical, the typical things that you want to do when you want to find a buyer. But before you go ahead and buy the, and, and, and trying to look for the buyers, I do recommend you to understand which retailers fit your products. Because if you're going to start to connect with retailers from, let's say, just as an example, Gucci, Okay, it's a bad example. Let's say Kate's pet. Most chances they would not buy from you because either they have their own name only selling on the pro on their store or they sell famous name only. You want to go to those retailers that fit your price and also fit your category, of course, but also fit the atmosphere. Atmosphere means that if you walk into their store and you don't need to walk into it because if you live in Australia, in UK, you can just YouTube that. I'll, I'll say it in a second. I'll explain in a second. But if you walk into the store and you see a lot of different brand names, then you know that this is what you're looking for. Because obviously they're buying from different vendors, small ones, big ones. Don't be afraid of this misconception of uh, uh, buyers buying only from big companies. It's not reality. Yeah. It's bullshit. I just to, to mention, if you don't, if you don't live in the states just like me, and you want to go into the store, just click the store name plus um, um, tour or walk-in on YouTube, and you will see everything as if it's in front of you. You don't uh -huh. even need to 
yeah, you don't even need to start your car or plane. <laughs> oh, I didn't know that. That's so interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. Cool. When somebody is ready to go to retail and they're, you know, they start looking for the right store and the right, or for the buyers, um, usually when you go to retail, what is um, the order, um, you know, the volume, volume of the order you can get? Because I'm asking that because I'm always telling when I'm having conversation with a lot of um brand they're talking to me and they're like we would like to also get to the walmart stores and <clears throat> i was like yeah you know but you 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 need to be prepared <laughs> with the right. volume this is <laughs> when they right. if but, they will check you 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 know so tell me a little bit but, about that so people kind of you know yes definitely so before i explain about it this this is there's something interesting you need to understand you're not the only one who's scaling here the retailer is scaling with you and this is a good point let me give you an example. If you work with Costco and you want to start releasing them orders, now they would come ask you for your paperwork to see what's your annual income of the business. They would take no more than 20% of that annual as, as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an amount that they're going to order from you. So if your business is doing 1 million a year, or let's say 10 million a year, they're going to order 20% of that amount maximum per year. The reason why they do it is because they understand that they, you cannot jump too high as a small brand and they do want you as a small brand in their stores or medium brand, doesn't matter. Uh, and they don't want you to jump too high and fall down. They want to grow with you and you with them. So that's why they do it. They minimize their risk by doing it because they know that sometimes yeah. they give you like, let's say, whatever half a million order okay half a million dollar order and for them it's nothing it's not even a point in their budget but for you it's huge you're gonna have to find and finance whatever two two hundred fifty thousand dollars for the chinese manufacturer they know you need to pay them 30 70 and most probably you don't have uh good enough payment terms with them and with with, with costco you're going to get paid only after the goods are landed plus whatever 30 60 days they work net plus something right and they yeah. understand that you are starting to you know build a so-called a hole in your budget they don't want that to happen and that's why they do the 20 percent now getting back to your question because I'm, I'm a little bit flying here <laughs> um, no, that is really interesting yeah and 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 uh, um so Basically, there are two types in general, two types of orders. The first type of order is a test order. A test order means that they're not sure about your products. They are interested. They think it's going to work and they want to try it. These type of orders would usually be somewhere between two to four to maximum 600 pieces per SKU. So if you have five SKUs, let's, let's say they picked and then by 500 pieces, then it's going to have 2,500 pieces in order. Let's say the wholesale price is whatever, 10, 15 bucks. Then it's not huge. It's 25, 30 thousand dollars. They test it not in the entire uh, stores, but only in your, you know their flagship uh, uh, stores. That's what DJ Max are doing usually. They don't take the big numbers in in the beginning. But this is one type of an order. And once obviously your products are proven to be selling good. Uh, that's where they get back to you and give you the big orders. But some companies knows how to analyze products in a level that they know exactly how much it's going to sell. Obviously, they have, you know, 1% here, 1% there of a mistake, but still. And I've seen an order from Nordstrom that was, I think, last year, around July or August or something like that. They order, ordered two, two purchase orders. One of them was, uh, it was... $350,000 first order with a new vendor. Mm -hmm. They trusted the vendor. They understood that the vendor is reliable. They asked all the questions. It was a process, of course, but then yeah. they knew what is how it's going to sell. And you know what? They never came back for uh, a repeat order until now, but who knows? But still, I'm, I know for sure that they sold the entire inventory. So either test order or bulk order, usually you're talking about smallest order of bit somewhere around twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 up to, I think, the biggest purchase order I've seen in one shot of one purchase order was 
1.4 million with um, that was with Menards. Uh, it's you know it's an outdoor retailer. So mm -hmm. yeah. Wow, that's, that's interesting. So you need to be prepared. You need to. I think you need to be already in a place where you know all your logistic and manufacturing is probably smooth, and you know exactly how much unit you can manufacture and how much time you cannot be in like in a place when you're like I think probably still new and right. Know. But but something very interesting to understand: people tend to to get prepared, and the preparation take them too much time. Mm -hmm. and, it, and they're starting you know to be to think about so many different uh theories and and, and cases that might happen that they're losing their time yes. the thing here is that you're not with brick and mortar you're not talking with seller central you're not talking with the platform you're talking with people with actual buyers you can always yeah. like for instance i got an order a huge mm -hmm. one i think it was i don't know was huge from macy's and that was like a few years ago with my own brand and i went back to the bar and said listen mate i can't make that big of an order i just can't do it so he said okay how much you want to cut i said 50 percent and eventually i got an order of 50 percent of what i was supposed to it was sorry a few hundreds of thousands of dollars still big order but yeah. it was it was not something that would kill my business i was just afraid that if there would be any issue down the road yeah. it's going to screw the entire business so you don't need to be afraid. There's always someone to communicate on the other side with. Exactly. I think that's that's a good point because you are working with the buyer. You guys like building a relationship. They, exactly. you know, they kind of guide you. If they work with you, you guide them. And, you know, you both have the same interest. Like they, you know, the buyers need that, you know, new, new things. They need to introduce all the time new things. So people think like, Sometimes I think a lot of brand thing is like an impossible mission to go into retail. But I think if you have a good product, the, the buyer are looking for you. They are right. there for you. So um, that takes me to my next question that is kind of relevant. So how you prepare before you actually approach buyers? Yes. So retail readiness is a big term. I just sent um, sent that in my newsletter and my WhatsApp group that I got an email from Bed Bath and Beyond. Yes, they they went chapter eleven, but they were bought by Overstock, so the marketplace belongs to oh. Overstock, and the physical stores, yes, belong to another two retailers, which I forgot which which one was it. There's no black hole, by the way. Whenever you hear about any retailer going off the business chapter 11 whatever it is there's always someone to take over and that's what happened with bed bath and beyond in a way that even none of their suppliers were was aware of that i knew it up front because i was in touch with someone but it's just a matter of luck but anyway uh to your question what was the question are you, prepared? Are you getting oh yes how you prepare so oh yes i'm sorry so they were emailing us a, a deck like they always do and the deck was referring to in big bold letters retail ready mm -hmm. and i was like wow this is something i'm talking about for years how do you how are you preparing to retail so i divided to a few topics as follow the first one is branding you need to have branding you cannot come up with you know low-end website or low-end catalog or not even having a catalog they do expect you to have the catalog so people asking me what the heck is a catalog i mean i know what is a catalog but are you talking about something printed no i'm talking about e-catalog on pdf and it has to be cool it has to be nice it has to match obviously to your logos and colors and vibe lifestyle but from the other hand you don't want to bomb them with lifestyle because they want to see products so what's the difference between catalog and website which both of them are under branding in short the difference is that your website as they see it and as you so-called see it is re is is talking with their consumer not with the buyer so does 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 you the vendor where's my hand there's <laughs> Oh, here, there's you, the vendor, and then there's the buyer, and then the consumer. So basically, when you sell in retail, you're selling to two buyers. One is the retail buyer, and the other one is the consumer. Yeah. Okay, which is interesting. But going back to that question, you want to have 
the catalog because the catalog speaks B2B, not B2C. And in the catalog, you're going to have something that you don't have in your website, which is pricing. And the pricing is wholesale pricing, not only retail pricing. We'll talk about that. That brings me to the second point that you have to be ready with, which is pricing. So basically, without going to too much details, because this is a huge topic in pricing, basically, you want to say that your MSRP, which is your retail price, the price you're selling on Amazon website or Shopify, wherever you sell, is going to be double of the wholesale price. Why? Because if you're selling them a product for $50, they want to double it and sell it for $100, but they can only do it if the MSRP, the retail price, is indeed $100. You cannot offer the, the, the product for $60 in your website and tell them, no, the retail price is $100. They see your, your information, your data, everything. Yeah. Anyway, half is where you start from. There's a lot of games with pricing because if you're talking about TJ, so they buy 30% of the retail. So if your product is retailing for hundred dollars, they would buy for 25, maximum 30. By the way, they would buy for 30 and not 25 in case there's a rep agent like myself involved. If you're looking at companies like Nordstrom, which I mentioned before, they usually work on a markup, IMU, initial markup of between 45 to 55%. That means that they're going to buy the product for either 45 up to $55 from the $100, which is a very good pricing. Yeah. It depends on the retailer and everything, but this is pricing. So we said branding, which is the website and catalog, and then pricing. Third and very important, very crucial point is the packaging. You cannot show them a product that you're selling on Amazon in a poly bag because a poly bag is, bag is not something that you can put stuck on, 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 on a shelf in the store, right? It has to be something appealing. It has to, to be a product. Well, I don't have a good example, but it has to say what is inside a picture of the product. And my biggest tip about packaging is keep it simple. Don't put TMI inside with all the small letters. Nobody wants to read it. Nobody tries to read it. And it doesn't have any effect. It has a great effect if you have a picture of the product on the uh, on the packaging, which means that once I step into the store, I look at the product. Oh, I understand what is it. I'm interested or not. Okay. Um, second, second great tip that I can give here is that most of the popular packaging in the last couple of years is with a white background. Okay. That is not referring to toys. If you walk into a toys company, uh, sorry, toys section in, in the retail store, obviously they're not going to be white. Why? Because our kids are not looking for something elegant and, yeah. and cool. They're looking for something shouting them. That's why everything there is going to be yellow, blue, red those kind of colors. So we mentioned branding and pricing and packaging. That is uh, the three most important parameters if you want to go read ready, if you want to be read ready. Obviously, there are more things, you know, around it, but these are really the yeah. basics. Once you have those, yeah. Yeah, yeah. We, we can definitely go hours. It's, it's so interesting. But let's take a quick break for a note from our sponsor, be right back. Sure. Wallysmarter.com is a cutting edge software tool designed to help online sellers make more money on walmart.com. Featuring advanced keyword and product research tools, Wally Smarter identifies high demand, low competition niches for you to capitalize on. With more accurate Walmart sales estimates provided by its easy to use Chrome extension, Wally Smarter takes all the guesswork out of selling on Walmart. Be empowered to make more informed decisions and grow your business like never before. Try Wally Smarter today with no credit card required. Did I say no credit card required? Anyways, use your coupon code Power 30 and get 30% off Wally Smarter today for life. All right, we're back. So um a lot of sellers, you know, brands, owners, they they when they thinking about going to retailer, I think they have that question, you know, not all products, like if it's not something they invented, let's say they just 
took, um, I don't know, um, a product that is selling very good and make it better, right? Like maybe another type of like lemon squeezer or something basic that, you know, people do buy a lot. And so I think a lot of them will be thinking, you know, why would the retailer buy, buy this product for me when they can go and manufacture it in China, right? Right. So none of the retailers, and you have to understand that besides companies like Walmart, I think they are the only one currently uh, produces in China. Just none of them produces in China. I myself used to live seven years in China and I was producing there also uh, for retailers. And I was asking that question as well. I've never worked with them directly. It was always through other companies or brands in the States. The only point where I started to work directly was when I was a sub supplier of Walmart in China. And when I created my own brand, but the brand was based in Canada. So for them, we were a Canadian company. Nobody, you know, was interested if, if my, I am living in China or doing whatever I'm doing. Okay. They do not produce in China. They don't take that risk or headache towards their business. That's one thing to know. Second thing to know is that don't never underestimate your brand, even if you're selling something very basic. So first of all, in the States, we mentioned between 30 to 16,000 stores per chain store. But if you count the chain stores, the companies that are chain stores, defined as chain stores, you have almost 30,000 of them in the States. Oh. So you're talking about 4 million, overall 4 million approximate. 4 million physical stores, retail stores in the United States. This is huge. And we're only talking about the States because that's my field, but obviously you can you can expand that to other countries. So going back to the States. So 30,000 retailers, that means that for sure, big amount of them is currently looking for your product. Now, if you're lucky enough and smart enough, you're going to be the one to win. It's as simple as that. I've seen that happening many times that I approached buyers. They said no. And the next year we approached again and they said yes, because a vendor left, a vendor stopped. They, were, they didn't have our products, whatever it was, so many reasons. So, yes. yeah. Yes, yes. So, you know, so you say, you know, don't think, don't overthink. I think people might be sometimes overthinking. Um, exactly. Just take action, just try, you know, what do you have to do? That's what I would probably say. Um, so when a retailer places an order, can they return the product if it's not selling? Very common and good question. Basically, they can. Usually, it's going to be in the contract before you even start moving any goods to them. If there's no contract, and usually there's none, it's going to be written in the purchase order, which is a legal, you know, uh, it's like a legal paper, just like a contract, but it's going to be said saying there what's happening in a case of returns and when is returns allowed. Usually they cannot just say, you know what, we didn't sell it. You take the goods back. It doesn't happen. It doesn't work like that. There's none of the retailers I work with so far, and I did work up till today with more than 400 of them, never ever returned something because they thought that this is a consignation type of business because it's not. When they buy it, they buy it under responsibility of selling it. But yeah. if you ship them goods and they're having a lot of, you know, defects or quality issues and stuff like that, then yes, you're going to expect returns. There are a few different ways to handle returns. Sometimes they can just deduct it from your invoice. So they, they short pay the invoice because of those defectives. Sometimes they can offer you to scrap it upon your cost or to return it to your warehouse and you do it at whatever you want. There's a lot of different options. In general, until today, I really haven't seen something crazy in terms of returns, only very small units. And most cases when it's a few, very few units, they will not even discuss this. They will not even talk about it. They will just, you know, uh, take it as part of the business. So yeah. we don't yeah. really deal with that, yeah. Yeah, I think I see a lot of sellers always complaining about returns. Uh, you, you guys don't have no idea how much returns big chains have. And yeah, and it's 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 a complete different thing in retail. It's like it's not even a topic that we talk about. I know that on Amazon it's like crazily happening. I know that. Yeah. So probably another question a lot of people are asking: um, if 
I want to sell to a U.S. chain store, do I need to have a U.S. entity like LLC or? In most cases, no. There are very particular and certain specific uh, uh, retailers that are requiring requiring that, such as Michaels with one thousand one hundred stores. But companies, big companies like even Walmart, even on their marketplace, they used to, you know, they used to accept only U.S. vendors, but now they accept vendors from everywhere, and we are bringing them on board uh, from different countries. So, in short. It doesn't really matter where your company is, as long as it's not an enemy country of USA, right? Because then you have a trade <laughs> issue. But usually, yeah. yeah, it's not even an issue. Obviously, it would be easier to handle the business in retail when you have a US company, because for them, you know, they work with onboard uh, uh, um, uh, remoted uh, companies. But for them, it just, it just clicks better when the company is in the States. And if you can do that, if you can establish a company in the States and it doesn't, doesn't cost more than a few few hundred bucks, uh, yeah. then it would be better, but it's not a must. Okay, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Is there a, maybe a specific uh, buyers or big chains that people we think it's so difficult to kind of contact them and get their yes. items in yes. that you can say, you know, those are actually not that bad. It's like they're you know they're open to discuss and it's easy to communicate with them so companies you know it's funny but the famous ones are the easiest one you know really yeah it's funny uh but if you look at companies like cvs personally it took me more than a year to get my foot into cvs for the first time with walgreen i've been trying for like ever no success, zero. I couldn't put anything on Walgreens stores, which is ridiculous. Yeah. Because with their competitors, I could I could do it easily. With uh, high-end companies from the outdoor world, such as Menards, Bass Pro, um, I wouldn't say big sport because they're not high-end, but all these outdoor companies, it's probably the easiest mm -hmm. because they're always looking for new stuff and new vendors and to add new vendors. It's, it's, it's a matter of, you know, state of mind. Uh, with TJ, it's very easy to work. They're very cooperative. Cooperative themselves, they are saying that they consider themselves as the most vendor-oriented uh, retailer, which is amazing. They don't even, you know, when they send you an order, they just send it by email and that's it. There's no EDI or anything, you know, computer that you need. There's no login. There's no terms. Nothing. It's like really working, you know, in a fish market with them. It's fine. Yeah, I know. I know. Actually, <laughs> I have experience with a friend that they um, manufacture clothes and they sell them for many, many years. And every time they come to Vegas, they, all the buyers come and we all go for dinner. And they're so friendly. It's like usually young girls, like so young. It's like, wow, you got, you got a nice job, <laughs> young lady <laughs> in the buyer for a TJ Maxx. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, like that it's all about relationship i think it's even with you know we think walmart a lot of people think i everybody i didn't met even one person that working for walmart that it was not super nice and friendly and just want to help with everything if we you know true. really different so i would say that just you so know true. just just go for it just try it. exactly so so interesting so and let's a little bit talk about walmart because you know walmart is kind of our thing so um i hear a lot of stuff you know from um from people that you know we work directly with walmart from the from the brand we're working with but tell me a little bit from your experience um how I'll can you, you get to walmart stores Okay, so Walmart, if you want to get to the stores, you really need to have something special because of the competition because everybody is trying to sell them. But mm -hmm. there's if you don't go through the, through the door, you're going to go through the window, right? Getting through the window. And this is how you do it. So um, there are teams on Walmart, and it's easy to find them. Again, LinkedIn and all those databases. Uh, there are teams there, and they have a program where they would be um, attaching you a buyer for a period of a year for the marketplace, not for the stores, for the marketplace. And they would walk you through all the steps you need, follow up with you every week of exactly where you're standing with your products, 
Mm-hmm. And then, and I've I've been hearing this a few times from a few different buyers there. When once you want to get to the omni channel to the retail stores, you would need to reach out to something like between seventy to eighty thousand dollars a month at least in sales. So that means that you know, instead of giving you a, a test order just like TJ are doing, they would not give you the that test order, but they would make you. They would have you sell on their platform, see the, you know, serial yep. volume there, how it goes with the graph. Everything is cool. Boom. You, they take you to the stores. Yep. It's very different from what it used to be. Because when I worked with Walmart 15 or 17 years ago, that was like, there was no marketplace, obviously. And and you would, once they like the product, they're going to bomb you with orders. But what I do want to say that I'm personally do not feel very comfortable with big orders from Walmart, not only because of the size, but also because I've seen a few vendors getting a lot of trouble with products that Walmart did not like and they wanted to return. Speaking of returns earlier, yeah. which is something that is really not common in the market. It's only Walmart with their, you know, giant shape is, is something that they might allow themselves to do so just be careful with them but basically that's what i know about getting yeah. into stores i haven't been doing it for the last couple of years to be honest with you but it's totally doable because as you just mentioned before they're so cooperative and so easy going they literally want to help you to get everywhere you want in walmart so yeah, yeah. so yeah i have the exact same experience yeah. with a lot of the brands we're working with uh, that a lot of them did went to the open call or um, they did got a buyer attention and it's the exact what he said the first you have to start with dot com and guess what i think it's amazing because it's easy now you need to go to dot com and prove yourself and then you will get uh, the buyer attention so if you dreaming on selling through walmart stores you have a huge chance with that you know with that dot com especially because there is so much traffic and brands do get a lot of sales if your product is a good fit and you're doing a good job on Walmart. Sure. And I see we have already a couple of brands that are um, being promised to get orders in stores in 2025. So that's so exciting to see that happening. But again, it is that process. So um, yeah, Walmart, walmart.com. So uh, Taylor, thank you so much. That was so interesting. I think we do have a couple of questions if you have a couple more minutes. Sure. Why not? All right. All right. So our first question is, I'm attending my first major new uh, NYC wholesale show this Sunday uh, to Wednesday, and I bought a booth. It's my first time, and I'm very nervous. I don't know anything about what payment terms to request. I have good branding and six products. There will be 4,000 plus brands and more and retailers looking for products. I'm in home decor. Uh, any tips? Yes. First of all, smile, smile, smile. Don't be worried whatsoever. I've been through this a few years ago when I went with my own products to New York Now show. And I was like th- sitting there and thinking the day before, like, what's going what's gonna to happen? Like, I'm, it's going to be embarrassing. It's going to be a big loss. I don't know what I'm doing here and so on and so on. And you know what? People came, started to look at the products. They were interested. They were nice. Uh, in terms of payment terms, you need to offer them net plus if they are a retailer if they are a company you know a known company if they are a small business you can offer them either 50 upon shipping and 50 upon arrival or a complete payment before it's shipped and that would be usually with small amounts it's going to be by credit card if not it can it can also be by a tty wire which is fine um but but try to be very cooperative again you have to smile and be happy about being there and about your products one thing i do want to tell you if you go in the show and this is something that i was telling my team all the time back at those days when i was selling my own products i was always saying fire the buyer just fire the buyer you look at your products and you're in love with them it doesn't matter if the products are responsive at the second at the second you're doing it you are in love with them even if it's even if it's a, it's a mobile that, that you're selling and it's not working right now you're still in love with the mobile you know, when my my iPhone shuts down, whenever it is low battery, I'm still in love with it, right? The same thing. Fire the buyer. Whomever is approaching, be cooperative. Be ready if you can with the purchase or I'm sorry, with the sales order draft. 
okay you can print it or you can have it uh, on the computer that you can send make sure you collect the information of all the people writing some notes you know this buyer is important this one is so so and so on to yourself don't show it to them uh but having a sales order draft is something very good to have in the show so they can immediately on the spot place orders okay also on top of that if you can be open-minded and say that you also can do um, any attribute upon request, what we call OEM, that's going to be good as well because sometimes buyers are running through you through your booth. They like the products. They are considering doing it under their name. You can offer them co-branding, which means your brand and their brand or their brand only. Then yeah, you become a little bit of manufacturer, but it's always a good thing to get your feet wet into the retail business just fire the buyer and smile that's the main thing that i can tell you and again pricing and 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 you know you have to give some credit uh especially to the big buyers net 30 net 60 and remember it's negotiable if they offer you net 60 and that's what they're talking about in the show then you know that this buyer is going to give you a hard time try not you know not to go to those places but basically know that whenever it gets to the paperwork that it's always negotiable i've seen companies big companies asking for net 45 and i ended up with net 15 and even sometimes getting deposit not really common but still i hope this addresses your question i hope he took notes that, that was so many good things <laughs> thanks uh, all right so our next question are retailers okay with buying products from china uh, all of my products are from china usually they prefer buying it landed in the states that's why they don't work with manufacturers because they don't like the import process that's the truth some of them if they're really interested in the product and they want to make you know they're going to have a great deal with great pricing and great product they would be willing to do the import but you're going to be actually doing it for them it's just it's just a matter of a harder process basically most of them i would say 95 percent of the retailers would say would expect you, sorry, to ship within the States locally, okay? Either from whatever, Jersey, West Coast, East Coast, LA, wherever your warehouse is to their warehouse, which they, which they, by the way, call DC, distribution center. They don't like to say warehouse. They don't like that term. I hope that addresses your question. Okay, uh, and do we offer our cost price with shipping included or without? No. No, uh, if your landed cost is $8, for instance, is a good example. And let's say your retail price is $32. You want to sell it at somewhere between $12 to $16. $16 would be the best, right? Because it's half of their retail price. It's just an example. But when you quote them a price, you quote landed in your warehouse. They call it FOB California, for example. I know it's not FOB, free on board. I know it's a common mistake in retail. Everybody knows that it's not really FOB because it's it should be EXW, but they just use the term FOB. When you see an FOB uh, a term from a buyer, you know that he's talking about the price in the warehouse in the States landed, and the shipping is gonna be on top of it. So. Either they, you're going to use your own forwarder or their forwarder, but either way, they're going to pay on top of the product price, the shipping. If they would ask you for included shipping, you always have to know what volume they're talking about because the cost for shipping divided by units is not going to be the same if it's 50 units, 1,000 units, or 20,000 units, just to keep in mind. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, Taror, if somebody want to learn more, and I know you you guys, you and Norm, uh, have this amazing training for... Uh, true. With Norm and with Aaron Harbage, that's true. Yeah, so yes. can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so basically, I think a year and a half ago, uh, Norm, uh, myself, and Aaron Harbage from Canada, which is my retail partner, we, the three of us, started to work on a retail course. We, we've been just thinking about how to give people the access to the entire complete information not only the how and where and when all these things we broke it to more than 60 different sessions of a course and we are also adding there the biggest that's why we call it retail secrets that's the name of the that um, project we call it retail secrets because we were trying uh, we were delivering 
and we recorded that within a year period of time, which is quite long, all the secrets of retail, how to do all the steps and all the tricks and even, you know, getting contacts uh, uh, from this uh, club of retail secrets. And it's now for a few days, I think it's a week from now or something like that. I'm not sure. Aaron is handling those issues, but it's going to be 50% off for this period right on the link that is on the screen. Yes, you guys, uh, go to Retail Secrets, that club. This is Norm, love the that club things, right? <laughs> and, and use coupon code, uh, right? 999 now for 50% right. off. Wow, amazing. So That's thank true. you so much and great information. And uh, we will, guys, see you next uh, Thursday for Q&A. And guys, don't miss it. There's so many amazing updates for Walmart that you guys have to hear. So make sure you're following up and we will see you next Thursday. Thank you, Mika.